from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And I want to welcome all of you to the National Book Festival. Sorry you were all standing in line, um, but we're going to have a conversation on the future of the planet um, with the eminent biologist Edward O. Wilson and the global economist Jeffrey Sachs. I'm John Hessler. I'm the curator of the J.I. Kislak Collection of the Archaeology and History of the Early Americas at the Library of Congress. And it is my great pleasure to moderate this discussion on some of the most important issues um, facing all of the inhabitants of the globe today. Our two conversants are, for the most part, most likely known to all of you um, by the crowd outside, known to not only you, but, but half of Washington, D.C. Um, so I'm going to give a very brief um, introduction. Uh, if I was to list all of their writings, appointments, university degrees, and other accomplishments, uh, it would certainly fill all the time that we, we have. Um, in fact, the last time I saw Jeffrey talk um, at Columbia University, it took Lee Bollinger 17 minutes to introduce him, and that was uh, what Lee said, his brief introduction. So, so we're going to be a little bit, little bit more concise uh, um, um, with the introductions. Um, so Edward O. Wilson is Emeritus Professor of Entomology in the Department of Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University and is a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize in nonfiction. He is the author of several recent books, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, this afternoon, uh, including the Letters to a Young Scientist, obviously inspired by Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet, um, and The Meaning of Human Existence, uh, which contains a lifetime of, of reflections on science and the human condition, and tries to do a topic that we are also going to kind of discuss a little bit this afternoon, that crossing of the, the scientist-humanist boundary, um, mm -hmm. that multidisciplinary boundary. Um, Jeffrey Sachs is Professor of Sustainable Development at Columbia University School of International Affairs and the Director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. He has been a Special Advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations on the, min min the min Millennium Development Goals which we will also talk about this afternoon. And he's also the author of several recent New York Times bestsellers, including The End of Poverty, The Price of Civilization, and his most recent book, The Age of Sustainable Development, has been called by E.O. Wilson, our other conversant, one of the most important books and a must read for anyone concerned with the planet's future. Now, part of the difficulty of what we're going to discuss this afternoon is that the questions are just as complex and controversial as the answers. They're all difficult, multifaceted, subject to ideological manipulation, and none of them are reducible to simple tropes. Um, neither of our two guests take that outlet um, and take that out when talking about the questions of the environment. Um, the, the questions we're going to talk about, poverty, the environment, immigration, climate change, just to name a few, forces all to come to terms with some of the vast complexities of what is perhaps for the first time in human history a truly connected and global world. All of these questions, how we choose to answer them and perhaps even more importantly how we choose to act on them, are critical to what it will mean to be a human being in the next century. That being said, if one was to pick a group of thinkers with whom to confront these issues, both Edward Wilson and Jeffrey Sachs would be on anyone's short list. I want to thank you both for being here this afternoon. And I thought I would start, being this is the National Book Festival, with a, a question that probably isn't exactly what everyone's here to hear about. I'm going to start a little bit easy before we get into the more difficult questions. But, but perhaps, um, Edward, uh, you can start sort of giving us an idea of, of the books that you read that kind of influenced you to, to become what you are, the books that are special to you that have kind of influenced your thought. Well, I began my interest in uh, all of these subjects <clears throat> uh, by uh, uh, through the door of uh, natural history. Ten years old, 1939, Washington, D.C., apartment a few blocks from the National Zoo in Rock Creek Park, and in, uh, thralled as a boy by uh, books on uh, the expeditions to collect animals in Africa and so on and the National Geographic, issue by issue, um, and my uh, trips uh, to uh, the National Zoo and the park. 
Um, I um, decided uh, at the age of 10 I was going to be an entomologist, and um, I'm happy to report to you that I am now uh, going to meet with the other members of the Green Committee that's uh, overseeing the redesign of Rock Creek Park. And that one of the recommendations that I've made as one that I made for other parks in the national park system that our national parks be made centers for science and education. And I think that's probably going to happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, no particular book would I want to cite right now, but I did think that that was a probably even more relevant description I just gave you. Yeah, a field biologist from the beginning, huh? So, yeah, so. born that way. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeffrey? Uh, thank you very much, first of all, and uh, thanks to everybody for uh, being here. I would name two books that, uh, for me, have been really pivotal in the sense that I've come back to them again and again uh, and really help shape my thinking and, and ways of uh, responding to our challenges. Uh, one is by John Maynard Keynes, who was the greatest political economist of the 20th century. A book, his first book, uh, first public book uh, called The Economic Consequences of the Peace, about how we ended World War I in the wrong ways. And he predicted that those diplomatic failures and bas basically failures of humanity could create major disasters later on. And it gave me, from the earliest time onward, the idea, let's be a little bit careful with each other. Uh, let's uh, not press our counterparts, uh, even uh, our antagonists, to the wall. Because if we do so, we can end up not where we want to be, but with disaster. The other book uh, is by an author named uh, E.O. Wilson. Uh, <laughs> because I have to uh, put it all out at the beginning. He's my guru, like uh, for so many others. He's one of the world's greatest scientists without question, and uh, certainly the wisest scientist uh, I know. And uh, the book that of many, many books I could list, uh, I think I could list most or all, not, probably not all of them, but uh, most of them as influencing me, but the one that made a really profound difference for me in my career was a book called Consilience, uh, which I recommend to everybody who thinks. Uh, <laughs> that's not everybody. Uh, that's the half the Washington in this room, but we're trying to reach the other half, by the way. They're, uh, they're in the Capitol. Um, uh, uh, only some of the time. <laughs> um, but consilience is a concept of knowledge that when you pull the thread, everything, everything comes together. Uh, and that it's first uh, an epistemological idea that all of different areas of knowledge really uh, have a, uh, an intertwined reality. But it also turns out very much to be a moral and ethical vision as well, uh, that if, if we're going to solve the kinds of problems that we need to solve as humanity, we have to put uh, science, uh, social sciences, uh, human sciences, and the humanities, arts, and ethics into that common, uh, that common vision. And so I, there hasn't been another book uh, as influential for me in, in a deep way because more and more that's what I try to fulfill in, in my own work. Well, it's, it's, uh, there's probably a lot of people in the audience here who could, who could cite E.O. Wilson's books as being inf influential in their lives. I have to say I, I have to agree with Jeffrey, but I have a different book that was very influential. Um, and mine was the theory of island biogeography. Um, strangely enough, when I was 14 years old, I ran, walked into the Princeton University bookstore and there was a first edition of this book. This is back in 1974. And the old edition of this was a yellow cover. It was almost, uh, um, yeah, it was filled with mathematics. It was like math porn. You know, there was, it was covered up and you couldn't tell what was in. 
And as but a, for a 14 year old, that's a, pretty good. It was, it was, it was <laughs> exactly. It was incredible. I opened this book, and there were all these equations, and it talked about mm -hmm. it talked about what I was really into, which was butterfly collecting at the time. And at the time, I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll do a model of Central Park, and it's Lepidoptera, and that was <laughs> the book. Basically, got me started on my my entire life was 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 that book, but but. So everyone has, has a, a big debt, debt to, pay, to pay to you. Um, so we'll start in with, with, we may as well just jump into some of the more complex issues that, that we're here to talk about. And Jeffrey, you've said um, both in your lectures and in your writings that climate change um, dwarfs every public policy um, issue facing us in the near future. Um, what is it about, about climate change that, that, that makes it so critical to, to the future of the planet? And, and the direction that our thinking should be taking. I'll start, if I might, with a, a statement which expresses the paradox of our times that uh, President Kennedy uh, made in his inaugural address when he said, for we hold in our mortal hands the ability to end all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And it was a statement about our most basic existential reality as a modern, in modern times. <clears throat> and that is that technology <clears throat> has gotten so good, we can solve ancient scourges that seem to doom us uh, to uh, uh, always be with us, such as poverty or hunger, many diseases. And at the same time, ironically, because we're so good and so productive and able to use so many resources, we have become, of course, a threat even to our own survival. And that's the paradox of being enormously productive. By the way, it's a footnote to anyone that says technology will rescue us. Technology doesn't rescue anything. It depends how you use it. It can wreck us or it can rescue us. And that's where the choice and the ethics come in. Now, it turns out that the biggest breakthrough in economic history since the beginning of agriculture came in uh, 1776, uh, not for the reason you might think uh, in the nation's capital. That was uh, only the third most significant event of 1776, uh, the Declaration. The, the first. Uh, was the uh, invention of the commercial steam engine by James Watt. That transformed the world even more. The second, I would say, was the publication of The Wealth of Nations, uh, since, uh, after all, we're at a book festival. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it was a big year. And the steam engine said, for the first time, we had a new way to mobilize energy other than muscle power of humans and animals uh, and uh, a little bit of wind and water uh, power, wind for sails and, or for mills and water for water mills, now we could tap fossil fuels. And that's tapping solar power that was sequestered uh, in geological time. And because of the steam engine, that could be turned into motion, into motive force for the first time. And that changed the whole world. And if you're a development economist as I am, Everything changes at that moment. Uh, a world economy that was more or less at subsistence levels of agriculture and almost unchanged population for century after century after century, really for millennia, suddenly became the modern world. Great stuff. And it is really great stuff, by the way, because if you're also looking at development, you know that life expectancy on the planet has more than doubled you know that poverty has gone from ubiquity to now one in seven if it's measured as extreme poverty. Similarly with hunger, everybody was vulnerable at the end of the 18th century and now hunger has been conquered. Not that we necessarily eat so well, but we uh, have the abundance of food that was unimaginable at the end of the 18th century. In fact, Thomas Malthus basically said, we're always going to be at the edge of hunger. That's all the good news. The unfortunate, and it almost is all the good news, because the other side of this is that it turned out 
with discoveries starting around 1824 and then picking up throughout the 19th century and really established by the end of the 19th century, uh, the discovery was made, which is there is a side effect. And the side effect is that when you burn coal or any of the other fossil fuels, carbon dioxide enters the atmosphere with a residence time of centuries and millennia. So we raise the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that changes the climate by trapping infrared radiation that would normally escape to space. And that's what's warming the planet. One thing I'd like to say very clearly to you is this was well understood in 1896 when spontaneous a Nobel winning Swedish chemist did the first calculations by hand of what a CO2 doubling would produce. And he got it, nailed it, even without the modern computers and the modern climate scientists, because he knew how CO2 molecules trapped certain parts of the electromagnetic spectra. This news has now gone everywhere in the world, literally except the Republican Party on Capitol Hill. <laughs> and I say this, I don't, I don't say this as a partisan because basically when you're in the things I do or that Ed does, you're not too interested in the partisan politics. You're not looking for a job. But it is odd that one party has been almost completely captured by the oil industry. It's corrupted, and it won't listen. The other party, half captured, by the way. <laughs> and so this is our tr true reality. Now, finally, to answer uh, specifically, we know from growing evidence that Ed's science has helped to produce in the field of biodiversity and ecology, and that my colleagues at Columbia's Earth Institute have been studying for decades that the effects of this warming are so deep and we're creating a planet of a kind that we have never seen during the whole history of our species, a climatology that is unknown to our plants, to our domesticated plants and animals, to our agriculture, to the places that we live, that we are creating a mega potential disaster. And we can assess that with some precision, but a lot of it is unknown and unknowable. But one paper that I would reference of one of my colleagues that came out uh, about three weeks ago, our lead climate scientist uh, in this country, uh, Dr. James Hansen, who was NASA's lead climatologist for 30 years, uh, retired last year from NASA and is a professor at Columbia University, shows that the last time we were even at temperatures that we're going to have very little chance to keep be uh, warming below 2 degrees Celsius, or about 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, compared to at the start of the Industrial Age, last time the Earth was at that temperature level, a geologic age called the Eemian Age, the last interglacial period, sea levels were about five meters higher than now. Now, one thing that Adam Smith taught us in 1776 is build your cities on the estuaries and the coasts for trade. And that's where the world's great cities are. I'm thinking of my own hometown, New York City. And I'm wondering how I'm going to get into my office <laughs> if we continue this way. Having to take a boat out of my flat and a, a boat to my office. But truly, of course, what I mean is that our great cities could be devastated. Our agriculture could be devastated. Our ability to support each other, devastated. And what I can add as a social scientist is that our capacity to handle even small crises are very poor. Economists typically say, oh, we'll figure out how to do that. But the problem is that when you have small crises, they turn into big crises often. That's what I learned from John Maynard Keynes. If we don't take care, if we push to the edge, things can go really wrong. 
and look at the crisis of migration in Europe right now, just how it's eating up the countries politically. No one likes migrants in this world. Look at the vulgarity of Mr. Trump. Look at how we act in a situation where we haven't even begun to see what would happen if we reached three or four or five degrees Celsius increase of temperatures compared to the pre-industrial level. So this is a big deal. It's no joke. It's our generation's challenge. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> actually, I would add just a footnote. We have a few weeks to get this right because the most important diplomacy of our generation is taking place actually between September and December at two high-level UN summits. President Obama's on the right side of this and uh, is trying to make good results. And we have a chance to make a difference uh, in the next few weeks. I know we'll come back to that. Right. I, I told you we weren't going to start slow. So, <laughs> so Ed, what, what, as, a, as a naturalist, as someone who has spent a lot of time in the field, a lot of time with both living and, and dead animals, um, what is it that worries you most about climate change? What is it that worries you most about the changes that we're seeing now? Yes, I want to address that, but let me just introduce this uh, with a return compliment to my colleague. I, this is not politics. This is not uh, just sort of a um, happy exchange between your principal speakers today. Uh, this is uh, something I meant to say anyway, and I, said, I say frequently, and that is, uh, when you read about the condition of the world and the history and the meaning of it and so on, don't read Kissinger, for God's <laughs> sake. Read, <laughs> read Sachs. And I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, um, start with the end of poverty and then read, if you wish to like to do it this, you can start anywhere in the series and read on through to uh, the age of sustainability. And you will have put out in uh, encyclopedic, a very effective language, what the real problems of the world are. And I'm going to take my short period of time here to pick one out and tell you something that you probably haven't heard about the living part of the world. And it's going to shock you. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you how to solve it and that's going to shock you even more. <laughs> um, what I'm about to tell you is based upon databases that have been published during the last 10 years in premier refereed science journals, such as Science, Nature, Proceedings of the National Academy, uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society. In other words, this is as good information as you can get. And it's going to be a series of facts that fit together. And I hope we'll show you uh, another aspect of uh, the grim situation we face, of which uh, climate change is a major part, but to which there are many other contributory factors that we don't trouble ourselves very much to think about. Um, now, first of all, I'm going to um, say that I'm speaking of the, um, I am speaking of the living environment, and I'm gonna give you my little mantra, which is, if you save the living world, then you will automatically save the non-living world. In other words, if you save the fauna and the flora, uh, the biosphere, then you will all, all, then automatically save the physical part, which is so much our, of our concern from uh, climate warming through uh, exhaustion of uh, irreplaceable um, natural resources and so on through a long pollution, through the long list that we all can recite uh, by rote. Uh, but if you save only the non-living part, you will lose them both because the uh, living part is absolutely essential uh, for the uh, proper moves for the humanity to take in order to save all of the rest of it in their own lives. Now, here are the facts that I wanted to give to you. 
the databases. Uh, first of all, and this is important because <clears throat> it surprises me no end that virtually, well, 90%, just to take a figure out of the air, but it's still not far off, I believe, of the um, references to as the discussions made concerning and the new information is brought to the public quickly is about the non-living environment. People, I think, have lost sight of what's happening to the living environment. So first of all, let me ask you, and then I will answer it quickly, uh, how many species, this is not Harvard class, as much as I'd love to warn you about the midterm, but in it, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is, um, how many species are there on, on the planet? of all kinds. Um, and the answer is we know almost exactly two million at the present time. We just passed the two million mark of known species, plants, animals, fungi, algae, protists, um, archaea, and bacteria. And um, two million known. How many uh, actually exist? Careful estimates have begun to zero in on about 10 million, uh, eight to 12 million approximately, but it's gonna be somewhere in that range, we think, point to be taken. We don't even know what's on this planet to the extent of, uh, say, something like three-fourths or more of the species that live here. We live on a little-known planet. We've only begun to explore it, uh, we need desperately to start mapping the biodiversity of this world so that we can save it. Next point, how fast are species disappearing? Answer, uh, to order of magnitude, uh, for example, in the freshwater fishes of North America, which is close to home, uh, the figure is uh, about 980. To the nearest order of magnitude, the extinction rate is a thousand times higher now than it was before the coming of humanity. And um, how long will it take to, uh, uh, for us to go down to one half of the species that exist, however many there are? Next question. Oh, and the, the uh, extinction rate is accelerating for reasons that include that just soulfully expressed by my colleagues. <laughs> uh, the uh, next one, how well have the conservation organizations and conservation efforts around the world done in stopping, stanching the hemorrhaging of species? Uh, how much have they reduced extinction rates? Answer, it turns out that among those species of vertebrate animals, those are the ones we know the most about, but probably the same is true for other species, kinds of species like invertebrates. The figure that have been rescued by uh, all the conservation efforts going back 50 years or more is approximately 20%. The rest are continuing to slide down the red list scale of endangerment toward extinction. 20% success. Uh, this is sort of uh, a, uh, we're in a situation where a surgeon, uh, for example, working on an accident victim can look up and say, I've stopped 20% of the hemorrhaging. Congratulations, <laughs> sir. The patient will be dead by morning. <laughs> um, and so we now are presented with a huge problem. And that is that the biosphere on which, from which we arose from where once our gods, our gods lived, that gave us everything we needed to create the civilizations that we have built, uh, this uh, advanced um, uh, empire of, uh, of reason and science and technology. All that came from the biosphere. The biosphere provides the blanket of resiliency we need for any kind of change occurring worldwide Included, including climate warming, and we are just letting it go. So uh, I would close with this, uh, with what I would like to see. Oh, by the way, yes, the, well, what should we do? 
What must we do? <clears throat> That's the subject of a book. I'm not selling books. Sell away. Uh, the subject of a book <laughs> uh, that <clears throat> I've just put together, read proof on it, will be out uh, by the end of the year called um, Half Earth. Uh, and it simply is that we, uh, in order to save Earth's biodiversity, uh, we absolutely have to put aside at least one half of the Earth's surface as a nature reserve, as a, you know, like. Uh, we, um, if, right, because you can do the math, uh, the, as you increase the area of uh, a reserve where wild species can of plants, animals, and other organisms can live. As you, we know this from field studies, we know it from theory, that uh, as you um, increase the area of a reserve, you are increasing it by the a fourth root of the area. Decrease it, you're decreasing it by the fourth root of the area. At the rate we are decreasing the natural areas of the world we are heading rapidly down to the level of only half of the species left. How much will it take to raise it very widely, uh, you're very roughly uh, estimated, to 85% save? Answer, half the surface of the world. And you can also examine biogeographically where the biodiversity, you know, where the species of plants, animals exist, and you can see what parts of the world we need to save. Now, for many, uh, that will, you're probably beginning to write down in your mind reasons why that can't be done, you know, primarily inertia, politic, uh, you know, uh, political difficulties, human selfishness, uh, the Republican Party, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all the reasons why there's no way we're going to be talking about setting aside half. We've set aside to this point 15% of the land surface, all the countries in the world. All the countries in the world have reserves, and collectively they've put aside uh, already 15% of the land surface, uh, only 3% of the uh, marine. But the marine is the easy one, and I don't want to take up more time, because uh, it's the United Nations studies have been corroborated uh, that we, uh, just by taking most of the open sea, we can repass that 50% mark. And it turns out that due to the special dynamics of pelagic free-swimming organisms in the sea that go in then to uh, the coastal protected areas, national uh, uh, areas of 200 miles out, uh, because they move in and out of the ocean, the open, the blue, sea, blue uh, water, uh, that if, you, if we protected the blue water, even a big chunk of it, no fishing, the production of food would increase in the territorial water. So that's not such a difficult one to face. The other, it can be faced. Uh, as well, and to those doubts rising in your mind uh, that it can't be done, I'm going to tell you it most certainly can be done. And that is what, why part of this has to be a big shift uh, in uh, our moral base of how we think about this planet and how including paramount we think about it beyond our own self, uh, the uh, rest of life. Uh, what kind of a species are we? What kind of an entity that we should treat the rest of life on this planet so cheaply? This is a century in which we are destroying it, and we've got to stop that. Uh, and so I propose a, um, as part of that, you know, shift in fundamental moral precepts, uh, something that you'll recognize as a modification of the, um, the, the oath of the physician, but for everybody, and that is do no further harm to the biosphere. Well, it's, it's interesting, you know, what you, what you see is that in both the, the statements that we, we know a great deal, we know the science, we've, we've, we've been there, but it seems, 
even though at this point we've got the best available science uh, around, it seems as if it's less and less capable of changing people's minds um, or causing them to act. Um, any comments on the, the difficulties of, of sort of the closing down of the scientific mind? Um, the more it expands, the more we seem to, to politicize it in a way that, that even perhaps uh, 30 or 40 years ago uh, didn't seem to be the case. Jeffrey, you can... Let me uh, put a little perspective uh, on, on that uh, question. For me, the starting point is the scale of uh, the human endeavor on the planet, the economic scale. And that involves two things. One is how many people we are on the planet. And second, uh, how much, uh, on average, each person uh, commands of resources through their economic activity. Both of those have increased roughly an order of magnitude, in other words, roughly a factor of 10 since the beginning of the industrial age. When uh, 1776 uh, came around with James Watt, the American Revolution, and Adam Smith, the world's population was about 800 million. Uh, today, it's 7.35 billion. And the most recent estimates, uh, they're not estimates, uh, different scenarios, uh, have us easily reaching 10 billion or more by the end of this century unless uh, uh, unless either we get a little smarter uh, on a number of fronts or disaster hits. Uh, in terms of the economic activity per person, back in 1776, 95 plus percent of the world was impoverished and living uh, off of subsistence agriculture. And if you put that into a number of the kind that we use as economists uh, in today's dollars, that might be an income of $500 per person per year. Today, we're roughly uh, at twelve dollars or $13,000 per person per year by the same kind of metric, even though me measuring this over two centuries is obviously not a simple or even meaningful thing to do, strictly speaking. This is a big global machine. It's interconnected. The most powerful actors in the world in this machine are not governments, but multinational companies, which have a reach often of operating in 150 or 170 countries of the world, often with a workforce of four or 500,000 people, sometimes more. They're enormously efficient operations, by and large. Uh, they're quite <coughs> remarkable to be able to operate at five uh, continents scale uh, and to be able to manage uh, supply chains uh, for products that may have 30 countries participating in the manufacturing of a product. That world has created huge benefits. If you work in places that are isolated, as my wife here and I do, uh, you would not want to live in those places. Uh, an impoverished village has children dying uh, all the time of absurd, tragic, totally preventable or treatable causes. People don't have the most basic services. There is hunger, there's backbreaking labor. So I want to stress there's every reason why people like development and the modern economy. It would not be given up lightly, should not be given up lightly. But it operates without boundaries. This is the problem. Of course, without national boundaries to speak of, without regulatory boundaries, in fact, because businesses are free to do all sorts of things that are wrecking the environment and to leave behind a complete mess, destroying whole ecosystems like the Niger Delta, or deforesting the Amazon, or leaving massive pollutants of, that uh, kill populations in mining uh, communities and so forth. 
And these companies are bigger than our governments in general. They own our governments, in fact. Ours is very clear. In the US, it's legal to buy your Congress. It costs about $10 billion an election cycle now. And that leads to a lack of constraint. The other boundary that doesn't operate is a moral boundary because we don't have clear ethics of practice of global scale society. We spend all our time fighting each other and often fighting absurd, costly, destructive, useless wars. And we don't think about how to cooperate for these common purposes. So my part of this uh, puzzle is a juggernaut. The world economy is actually quite successful, don't doubt it. Uh, it is a $106 trillion a year enterprise. There's a lot of money involved and a lot of people that are pushing hard for growth. And that growth can lead to new roads in, uh, in the kind of endangered uh, ecosystems that Ed was just talking about. Of course, to grow the food for 7.3 billion people means putting about 100 million tons of chemical fertilizer on the soils each year. A lot of that gets recycled uh, in dangerous ways, ending up in estuaries and eutrophication and dead zones like we have at the Gulf of Mexico. But that's a phenomenon now in more than 130 estuaries around the world. One of the problems with reserves is that this global system has massive reach across large distances. The dam gets built upstream and the ecosystem way downstream, whether preserved or not, can be devastated. Global warming could wreck the Amazon even if we stop deforesting the Amazon and so forth. So the problem is, as Ed says, to draw limits and boundaries on a system that doesn't like boundaries and that is so powerful politically and has numbed us in a way psychologically and morally and leads to a kind of race where everybody is so desperate not to fall behind the neighbor who might attack or uh, simply run ahead that the common interest is squandered and the inertia is extremely strong. So this is not in general willful destruction and self-destruction. It's thoughtless, inadvertent, unprecedented self-destruction. That's different. And that's what makes it even more insidious, hard to recognize. It's an unprecedented situation that we're in because of our success, not because of our failure. When we were poor, we could kill each other but we could not wreck the planet. <laughs> now we're rich, so we can also kill each other, but we can also wreck the planet in a completely unprecedented manner. And that is what makes this very, very hard. I'll give you one, if I may, just one practical example of we've mentioned, I will continue to mention uh, the, the capital uh, because it has been uh, an enemy of reason for more than almost two generations now on these issues. In 1992 at the Earth Summit, which was a pinnacle of international law on the environment, the treaty, the Convention on Biological Diversity was established listening to Ed and he made the concept of biodiversity known to the world he and a few colleagues. And the Convention on Biological Diversity is a wonderful treaty, actually, to protect biodiversity. It's international law. There's just one problem. There are a few, but one big one for us. We're not part of it. Because literally, Newt Gingrich, in his contract on America, convince the Congress that property rights dominate the right to destroy species. Honestly. And so we never ratified that treaty. 
We're not even part of the protection, part of the stakes of this. It's unbelievable, actually. And that's what comes from a corrupt political system which we have and a reification of the market as the end goal, not as the human instrument for well-being, but as the end purpose. You're told on the one side our species are being destroyed, on the other that that might limit private property rights. What wins in our capital? Quite literally, when these are put on the scale, the private property rights. And so this is a category confusion. And I'll mention one more great read. The big read of this summer, and I hope for many summers to come, is the Pope's encyclical, Laudato Si. It's pure Ed Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Completely wonderful. And by the way, scientifically, absolutely sound. To the point, beautiful, precise. The, the Pope was trained as a chemist also. And he shows, by the way, that in the Roman Catholic Church, at least since Thomas Aquinas, the notion of faith and reason together is at the essence. And so science is completely the norm. And the Pope is very clear about that. And the Pope talks about precisely this question of which is the morality, the well-being of the planet, including humanity, or the market system, per se. He's not against the market system, but he says it needs a moral framework. And Ed talked about a moral framework. I find that that's essential for us to get back to something sane. But don't think of it in a necessarily mystical or even particular religious point of view. Morality is rules for our goodness and well-being, that's all. And if we forget that we need rules to put bounds around this economic juggernaut, believe me, it's so powerful that it's going to run roughshod over nature, which it's doing, and over every Congress and Parliament in the world as well, because it can buy them. And that's what it's doing. Wow. <laughs> I knew there was going to be some. <laughs> One of the things that you both talked about here, at least seems to me, is that there is this huge gap um, between what we're thinking and what we're doing. Um, let's call that, for purposes of discussion here, a sustainability gap. In other words, that there's this incredible moral, um, not necessarily scientific, but moral and economic gap between where we're going, where we're headed, and somehow getting on a road to, to sustainability. Um, both of you have talked about and written about sustainability in, 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 in your writings. Um, uh, Ed, what is, what is your kind of take on, on are we on the road? And, and besides even, even environmental issues, what, what do you think the road should be? Where, where should we be moving as far as sustainability is concerned? Um, when we talk about things like um, 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 game preserves and things like that, um, what is your feeling? Are, are we moving in a direction that you are hopeful of or, 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 or not? Um. I'm, I'm hopeful when I read statements uh, by um, men of uh, Francis I caliber, such as the following, I just love it. All species, no, every species and every pond is precious in the sight of God. Uh, I believe that what we have going for us uh, is not yet a formulaic uh, part of world culture, and certainly not part of any particular national culture to the effective degree needed, of a um, placement among those that small numbers of universal moral precepts that we've accepted since biblical times. Um, we have not placed among it uh, the saving of the rest of life because it was never something we 
uh, found ourselves destroying, at least we weren't aware we were destroying it, humanity. Quite the contrary, we were conquering. It took everything we had in the pre-industrialized uh, age uh, to, uh, to break into the, to the wildlands and to, to start settling them. But what we have going for us, I think, um, it might be just a struck of low luck. And here, I'm not sure if um, um, Professor Sachs would approve of my student's report in an area in which he's really expert. But I see several unintended or several phenomena ongoing in our social and economic trends that do have some promising um, unintended consequences in terms of helping make it a little easier to take the shift. The first is women's fertility. And that is that universally, uh, women, when given some small degree of economic power and independence, so they can make a decision, uh, choose a small number of quality children over playing the roulette with what the number of husbands would like to have. And thus, the, average, the uh, fertility rate worldwide has dropped in every, well, worldwide, in every country, uh, the fertility rate has dropped uh, to uh, close to the zero population rate, 2.1 children per woman or below, in some cases, Italy, I think, has in the past lived, uh, you know, but led the world uh, to the point where a number of uh, nations now, particularly in Europe, are entering negative population growth. This is universal uh, because uh, it's uh, the uh, uh, fertility rate <clears throat> necessary for, uh, for positive population growth is now limited to um, a uh, uh, few places, most critically Sub-Sahara Africa, uh, other than South Africa. And that's why, which is one of the many reasons that Africa is so important. And I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you know, as a witness uh, to see, uh, and as a member once of his advisory board, to see the Earth Institute under uh, just leadership putting so much emphasis on Africa for so many different reasons. That's the make or break continent for the rest of the century. At any rate, Patagonia, <laughs> uh, the Middle East is above and not coming down yet of uh, Pakistan. Uh, but those areas are shrinking. And I believe that the United Nations population analysts have the last estimate I've seen put the uh, Population for the, for the world was rising still above 7.3, <clears throat> excuse me, at somewhere close to 11 billion, providing we don't have suddenly a turnaround and a runaway uh, increase in uh, fertility, uh, and providing that um, Africa does not, you know, uh, can be brought in through the demographic uh, transition, and that's what we desperately want. But there are other reasons to be, to think there are other in unintended consequences that we might be able to ease the whole transition we want to a, a newly ordered world order. Uh, and that is, of course, the implosion of populations into cities. If we can make livable cities and uh, I'm so happy to see urbanology rising very swiftly as a major science now. If we can make livable cities around the world, uh, <clears throat> we're going to end up with a large part of the population off the farms, off the wildlands, off uh, the unproductive uh, substance agriculture that uh, hundreds of millions uh, depend upon, uh, to um, a, uh, a far more advanced, technologically advanced uh, agriculture, including things like uh, vertical farms uh, with lead lighting and just so many things. Ag agrobiology 
is unfortunately still a very primitive science. We need a lot more effort put into world agrobiology. Did you know that 50,000 plant species out of the total of 370,000 we know, flowering plant species, um, are thought to be, uh, contain edible or maybe palatable plant parts, and that's what we need to be getting into. Uh, but um, the other is, um, here is not so, maybe so clear, but uh, I believe that because the critical measure is the ecological footprint, how much land, or land surface or volume above it do, uh, does the average person require for all of their needs? And it looks as though that's about to begin to shrink because of advances in uh, technology, and particularly in what you, I like to call, or others do anyway, the BNR uh, uh, industries, biology, nanotechnology, and uh, robotics. Mm -hmm. But the advances in artificial intelligence, the advances in whole spheres of um, industrial, uh, digital industrial, evolution that's, uh, by, which is um, uh, now taking place, spreading around the world uh, is going to be, believe, I believe, a result in a steady shrinking of uh, the, uh, uh, of the um, uh, individual space required, the footprint. Uh, there's another trend, too. And here I'd love to hear what my mentor in these areas would say. And that is we seem to be ready to shift from uh, external or, or uh, extrinsic to intrinsic economies where our economies and, and uh, uh, economic growth becomes less and less, the taking of more territory, uh, the building of more and more large uh, uh, artifacts, and more and more moving toward uh, a uh, quality, high quality uh, of products that cost less in energy, less in materials, uh, require less repair, et cetera, et cetera. And I think since that is the, the spearhead itself of the, of the market uh, economy, global market economy, to produce products like that, we might see a shrinkage of the um, of the, of the footprint, the ecological footprint. Now, could it be possible that stumbling along as we are carelessly on the edge of destroying ourselves and the rest of life, we might actually luck out and find it possible to take the steps we need to take? Uh, Professor Sachs? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was gonna be my next question to you. Uh, how do we get there? <laughs> how do we get on the path? Um, um, are you as hopeful? A, a few years ago, uh, I asked Ed to write a uh, <coughs> forward to uh, one of my books, uh, Commonwealth, uh, and he wrote a line which I thought was one of the most wonderful lines uh, that described uh, this situation, he said, so we have stumbled into the 21st century with our Stone Age emotions, our medieval institutions, and our near godlike technologies. Uh, and uh, th these are the three cycles that are running out of kilter with each other. Technologically, there is a feasible path to sustainable development. By the way, not just a feasible path, a feasible path with much improved quality of life for the planet. So this is not a kind of hair shirt lecture that we've overshot and now we have to go back to poverty. It's rather saying we have to use our technological know-how for renewable energy or for uh, going from internal combustion engine to electric vehicles. Doesn't everyone want to drive a Tesla, actually? Uh, I do. Uh, and, and so. If we do that, there is a pathway to success. The questions, though, are, are really our uh, Stone Age emotions and our medieval institutions. Can we choose to get there? Can we decide that it's important? Can we know about it? Can we be aware of it? 
and then can our institutions, which creak along, Ours is from 1789. There's a lot of genius in it, but it's showing wear and tear also. Can we actually make these institutions work and in a short period of time? Because there's another concept I learned from Ed. You see, this is a true, true thing when you have a guru sitting next to you. He called this many years ago, probably 20 years ago, uh, that this is the bottleneck. And if we can just get through this bottleneck, the other end safely will get there because yes we will stabilize world population there let me note that the world population if we worked hard at it in the right way that is ensure that every girl gets at least a secondary education that's the basic <laughs> that's all you have to do as ed said if you did that we could probably stabilize below 9 billion people. Where the difference is, is in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'll give you some numbers that are a little bit disconcerting. In 1950, the population of Sub-Saharan Africa, that's all the countries below the Sahara, was 180 million, according to the UN statistics. Today, it's 950 million, five time increase. The medium fertility projection, which is a kind of extrapolation to the 2100, has four billion people. Now, I work with the African leaders uh, constantly, and I tell them there is no way you can end poverty, preserve the physical environment, overcome food insecurity, and so forth with four billion Africans. The continent, by the way, is one of the most vulnerable places to climate change because about 70% of the ecosystems are semi-arid to arid. They're drylands. They're very, very vulnerable to higher temperatures. Many of the crops are already at the margin of uh, thermal stress. So this is where Africa could stabilize around two billion or could be four billion. It'll make a phenomenal difference to Africa's well-being and to the world's. And all it would take would be to help ensure universal secondary education in this generation. We wouldn't even notice it in the budget, by the way, because compared to what we waste in Iraq and Afghanistan, you can't even imagine. It would be a tiny fraction of that, tiny, but all we have on Capitol Hill is really, in this area, vulgarity and ignorance most of the time. Cut out all the foreign aid. Don't do this. Why should we do this? It's disgusting, actually, because it's a lack of basic principles and it's a lack of basic sense. And we don't have time right now, but I could regale you with stories about why we're in wars in the places where we are, because often I go to those places five or ten years before we went to Yemen in 2005. I came back terrified. I said, this place, from an economist's point of view, is in desperate situation. Do something. You know what Washington's added? Oh, why should we care? Why do we, Yemen, what do you, Sachs, get out of here. We have more important things to do. Our next tax cuts for the hedge fund managers. <laughs> okay. So that's where we can't seem to get it clear that this is really important. Now the good news is there is the path for sure. And if we really thought about it, we'd even find it with a lot of precision. Because when President Kennedy said that same year in 1961, let's put a person, man to the moon and bring him back safely to the earth by the end of the decade, and then our best engineers really thought about it, Look at the miracle that they created. But we're not thinking about these things very hard. Where's our team of engineers, literally engineers, saying how do we use information technology to make sure that every child can get a quality education in the world? Because it's costless to provide education in thousands, tens of thousands of books, local language instruction that way. We have to care. That's really the missing factor. That's the irony of all of this. 
which is that we're so rich, if we just cared, we could do it. Now, one message that I like to give is, if there are any billionaires in the audience, come see me afterwards. <laughs> uh, if you know any billionaires, drop them an email after the session today. I mean it seriously. There are 1,826 billionaires. I can tell you on a professional basis, it's impossible to use a billion dollars even for your own well-being. How many houses, planes, and other things really do you need without going crazy? Now, these billionaires have a combined net worth of $7.1 trillion, 1,800 of them. That's the racket of the planet. If that were a Harvard endowment, but now I would talk about a Columbia endowment, <laughs> uh, but we could share it, uh, that would have a payout each year of $355 billion a year, just the payout rate, 5% payout. I can tell you, again, as a development economist, we could cure every, of course, every vaccine-preventable disease and mothers dying in childbirth, have uh, child mortality down to the lowest levels, ensure that every child is getting through secondary education, and we wouldn't even come close to using the first hundred billion of that. That's how crazy this is. So again, that's where the concept of choice is the most fundamental one. We have to choose that that's the course we want to take. And I'll give you now one more piece of important news, if I may. Just three weeks from now, the world will gather, the heads of state will gather at the United Nations on September 21st, 25th. The first speech of the day will be Pope Francis, which is cool because he will tell the world leaders this is a moral issue, and he'll be absolutely right. Then the world leaders will deliberate, and at the end of the day, they've already agreed on the document. They will adopt what are called Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. Go home and read them. Memorize them. Be the first in your family to know them. I thought 17 was too much, but with a little practice, I could do it, and you could do it. They're good goals. SDG 3 says universal health coverage. SDG 4 says every child should get a secondary education. SDG 11 says that every city should have a sustainable development plan. SDG 13 says we should control human-induced climate change. SDG 14 says we should pre preserve the marine ecosystems. SDG 15 says we should preserve the terrestrial ecosystems. These are good objectives. There are targets underneath them. They will become global goals, including for our own country, starting on September 25th. They will have a 15-year period of application from January 1st, 2016 to December 31st, 2030. Please become champions of these. This is our hope to have a globally agreed direction, exactly what Ed called for a generation ago. We're close to having truly the governments all agreeing to this. And I'll tell you the reason why they're agreeing. I speak in the General Assembly all the time. Everyone is scared now. Everyone is really nervous. If I say with 193 ambassadors sitting there, your country, Mr. Ambassador or Madam Ambassador, has had a climate disaster this year, not pointing to anyone, all heads nod. Someone's had heat waves, someone's had unprecedented uh, floods, someone's had a, a, a Category 5 typhoon, and so on. Everyone's nervous, so here we are agreeing. Now, the first moment of putting this new general, non-legally binding, only morally binding idea into operation will start November 30th. Mark your books. 
November 30 to December 10 will be what's called COP21. COP21 is Conference of the Parties. They are the signatory countries of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change that was agreed at the Rio Summit in 1992. That one we did ratify. But when you ratify a convention, you need an implementing agreement. We said no to the Kyoto Protocol. We failed to reach an agreement when we tried in Copenhagen in 2009. And this is the last chance to do this in Paris this December. So we have two steps that are going to determine our future, actually. Surprising, because they're not even known here. Donald Trump has taken all the airtime. Honestly, what are we doing as a country? listening to this when we should be talking about important things, which thankfully we have a chance today, which is wonderful. We need to implement a serious climate agreement. The good news there is that for the first time ever, China and the United States have both said we're going to do it and we're going to do it in tandem. The two biggest climate changing nations in the world. We're no longer number one on that. China's twice the emissions, half per person, but twice in total of us. But now China and the United States together said, we'll walk through the door together in Paris. That's the best hope we have on the planet. So we have a chance right now. Please, every one of us has to be the ambassadors for making this happen. Oh. Well, I think we have about 15 minutes left, so I think that's probably a good note to end the discussion on and uh, to take some questions from, from the audience. I think uh, people should go to the, the microphone. The microphones, yeah. right. Uh, thank you both for a very illuminating talk. Can, uh, could you speak up? Yeah, we could start on the right there. Thank you both for a very illuminating talk. Uh, Washington hosts an environmental film festival every year, and one of the words they have been emphasizing for the last two festivals is the word Anthropocene, the age of humans, which has a sobering implication that just as the age of dinosaurs came to an end, the age of humans could also come to an end. A related question I have is, thanks to climate change and the inexorable growth of population, Malthus's theory may eventually come to fruition. And the only way we can survive as humans is to populate some other planet. What do you think about that? Shall I take a start? Yeah. Yeah, sure. uh, first, a good word for everybody to know, Anthropocene. Yeah. So Anthropos, human, and scene is what the geologists use for a geological epoch. And it was a term coined uh, by uh, Nobel laureate Paul Crutzen, who was one of the three scientists who discovered the ozone depletion effect of the chlorofluorocarbons. It means not good news that humans are uh, in control. It means that from a literal geologic sense, we've entered a new Earth period of the kind that Ed described where humanity is the major forcing variable changing the, the biosphere, even the lithosphere, uh, the hydrologic cycle, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and so forth. It's a warning term, but also being used now by geologists, not metaphorically as, oh my God, what are we doing, but also literally as saying, if you were just a geologist viewing Earth systems from the outside, you would declare a new epoch has started because of the strange ways that the Earth is behaving compared to what has been our epoch, the Holocene. So that's what the term means. If we can't 
inhabit this planet properly. Don't think about the next planets, by the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it was wonderful to hear the word oceans mentioned uh, by both of you on the planet and the importance of that biosphere, um, which is so often forgotten. Uh, often on issues of climate change, everyone looks up to CO2 emissions, but there's very little looking down to what's happening in the ocean. And so a question for each of you, um, Professor Sachs, how do you convince the political classes of the importance of addressing what's going on in the ocean um, and the importance of, of getting action to ensure sustainability there. And Professor Wilson, how do you get the scientific community to recognize how important action such as you described is? Thank you. There shouldn't be a lot of problem of, um, in addressing the um, protection of the ocean among scientists, uh, actually protecting it against the uh, rapid uh, acidification is one thing, uh, but uh, some of the other aspects of ocean deterioration, as I mentioned earlier, are uh, seem to be within, uh, they seem to be soluble. Uh, at the present time, uh, what has been most heavily uh, impacted has been uh, the coral reef systems. They're disappearing rapidly. I think something like one third are gone. Uh, a large percentage of the species of corals are disappearing. And um, so we need uh, to focus a lot of, of activity on those. But affecting everyone in the world, of course, is the ocean and uh, the um, uh, and the inland or the um, shallow uh, coastal waters. Um, the fact is that <clears throat> if we could persuade uh, the individual coastal nations that have the capacity to pr uh, protect the, uh, uh, not only their territorial waters, but also the uh, uh, open sea that's within their power, if we could uh, uh, persuade those uh, nations uh, to join uh, in a resolution, or shall we say, join in an agreement of the strength uh, that um, uh, Jeffrey Sachs has been mentioning we need to have for the uh, forthcoming um, United Nations um, uh, ag uh, agreement, then um, a specification. Um, then uh, you could have a very quick progress there. We are at the present time, uh, we've had not a lot of extinction in oceanic species uh, because oceanic uh, species are uh, generally, uh, if they have any mobility, they uh, migrate for long distances either swim themselves or release larvae that follow the major currents for long distances. Um, and um, so they uh, have maintained their ranges, even though in the case of pelagic fish we use for food, <clears throat> the um, biomass has been cut by an incredible 98%. I don't think people realize that the fish that they order, the marine fish they order, when they go to the seafood restaurant uh, is coming off of uh, a 2% uh, that's, in many cases, that has to reproduce very fast to keep up with that. At any rate, uh, I mentioned before that if we could get <clears throat> the uh, coastal nations to agree uh, to um, uh, that no more fishing be done beyond the territorial waters, you will see uh, and there have been two uh, modeling efforts to show this, an increase of um, biomass productivity in fish species and a lot of other life too uh, in the shallow territorial waters. So that's step number one. Total protection would be ideal, uh, but uh, we have in place a United Nations-based study of about 10 years ago 
in which um, just a large part of the put aside would have that, that effect. And then we have to quickly turn our, uh, if I haven't lost the thread of your thought, uh, we have to turn our attention to um, the acidification. That, that's really a terrible problem because that can affect every part of the um, massive uh, waters that make up most of the Earth's surface. I'll just to make one sentence. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, these global goals that I mentioned, the sustainable development goals, are important is that when they're adopted, then the expert communities should go to work and say, if you really want to achieve SDG 14 on protecting the marine ecosystems, oceans and marine ecosystems, here's what needs to be done. The politicians don't know. And we need the focus of the global expertise to give the guidance. And once you have the goals, that actually puts them into a kind of dynamic where we're going to start hearing a lot of reports and a lot of studies incredibly valuable to say, you really want to achieve that? Here's what you need to do. Thank you both so much, Professor Wilson and Professor Sachs, for your insights and all of the work that you're doing to help make the world a more livable and better place. I'm really honored to be here with you guys and grateful that I got in. Um, <laughs> question for you. Um, the United Nations says that the animal agriculture industries, the meat, egg, and dairy industries, contribute about as many greenhouse gas emissions as all of transportation, all the cars and trucks and boats and planes and everything. We know that eating a vegetarian diet causes far fewer greenhouse gas emissions than eating a meat-centric diet. And given that Americans eat more meat on a per capita basis than just about any other nation on Earth, why do you think it is that there is not as much discussion on the need for us to eat less meat as a country and really in the first world as a whole? Well, <laughs> want to take a uh, guess? You know, uh, <laughs> Uh, we sure do like our big, thick, uh, juicy steaks. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, we have uh, grown up in an ethos in which hunting big animals and then uh, 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 raising them in huge herds uh, has uh, transformed our uh, eating habits way, way too far over to a carnivorous diet just measured by health effects alone. And um, I would think that here the medical profession could play a key role in continuing to push people toward a vegetarian diet just for their own personal good. It's, it's not fun for the family to have the, uh, to have the uh, principal uh, wage earner, man or woman, die at 49. And so uh, that pressure could help. But also by doing what I suggested very quickly of utilizing uh, the immense botanical potential uh, of diversity and the potential for food, new food crops around the world uh, and bringing into play uh, varieties that uh, can greatly increase uh, food production on those lands we use now for agriculture uh, would would be uh, a huge step forward. You may know that we uh, we depend primarily on just a half dozen grains, and these grains uh, are uh, the ones that uh, our late uh, our Neolithic ancestors uh, came upon in the wild and then cultivated and they spread around the world and we haven't figured out or even tried to replace them. But it's been estimated there are as many as 50 percent, I mean 50,000 uh, species of plants, <clears throat> uh, many of whom could prove superior to the vegetables we use uh, when cultivated and modified by, yes, genetic modification, <laughs> uh, that uh, we uh, we, you know, we could have a whole new agriculture uh, that would be far more uh, easy on the environment with it, that we could grow now in um, extreme saline environments and extreme 
wastelands and so on. Uh, we haven't even begun to uh, work out the full capacity, I think, of the globe for food, human food production. And most of that will be, um, will be plant and, yes, bacterial. Uh, wait until the microbiologists really get exposed. <laughs> on, uh, they, they already can create a new bacterial species. From and we're just going to give Jeffrey the last word here. <laughs> this will be the last uh, question. I'm sorry that uh, the other question Actually, I, I want to tell you a Washington story. <laughs> because this is a great question, and it reminded me of, uh, OK, here it goes. <laughs> Our dietary guidelines come out from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Well, you can see already a problem. <laughs> but the way that they are done has gotten better because there is a scientific advisory body that gives independent scientific advice to the Secretary of Agriculture on dietary guidelines. This year's report, if you look up, I don't remember, unfortunately, the exact title, but it is something like the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutritional Guidelines for USDA. You can look it up online. Is a wonderful report. And it talks about what a healthy diet is and how the traditional pyramid that was promoted by the USDA was a lot of unhealthy things, but basically a lot too much carbohydrates and a lot too much uh, beef and so forth. There's a chapter this year, excellent, exactly on your question. What are the ecological, environmental implications of a healthier diet? Great chapter, because now joining environment and nutrition, the main finding it's healthier for us to eat less beef, and the weight on the environment of the beef production is huge. And so if we combine healthy nutrition with its implications, we get a double dividend, better health and a much lower environmental impact. Beautifully discussed, scientifically justified. What did our Secretary of Agriculture say? Honest to God. He said, who told the committee to do that? <laughs> he said, and I'm almost quoting, my grandson is in kindergarten. They teach him to draw within the lines with his crayon. I think our committee should learn from my grandson. <laughs> that's America. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where we will end it. Um. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.